Hi there guys, Tower Tech here. I hope you enjoyed that little montage of time-lapse photography. This video is gonna be all about how you could create something like that for yourself. And I'm gonna take you through three different time-lapse scenarios. One is the daytime time-lapse, taking photographs of clouds as they move across the skyline. The second is gonna be the nighttime photography, getting those beautiful streaks of light from cars. And the third is gonna be a bit of a dabble into astrophotography, having a look at those stars as they move across the night sky. That takes quite a long time to do. The first thing I'm gonna do is take you through the equipment that you need. And primarily you need two things. One is a decent camera that you can manually adjust all of the settings on. And the second is a device called an intervalometer. An intervalometer is a device that allows you to set intervals of time that the shutter is gonna be released on the camera. So it connects into your camera's remote port and you can get two variants of these. You can get a wired one and a wireless one. I'd recommend getting the wireless one. They're only about 20 pounds on Amazon, so not cost prohibitive at all. If you have a wired one, you end up with it awkwardly hanging from the camera, not really quite sure what to do with it, and you have absolutely no versatility at all. You have to be very close to the camera. If you've got a wireless device, you can be a little bit more mobile while still keeping control over the camera. And these intervalometers are fab. So this one can not only send the interval of time for the shutter release, but it can also define how long you want to press the shutter button for, i.e. allow more light onto the sensor. I'm actually gonna allow the camera to do that. So that's an intervalometer, cheap yet effective. It's important that you make sure that you pick up the right intervalometer for your camera. So depending on whether you've got an icon, Panasonic, a Sony or a Canon, you will have a different type of connector that goes into yours. Now I've got two Canon cameras, I've got my 600D and I've got my 70D and thankfully they both use the same remote connector which is absolutely fantastic so I can use that intervalometer on both devices. Now, coming onto the camera itself, you do need a decent camera. You need to be able to adjust three settings on your camera. One is ISO, one is your aperture size, the other is your shutter release time. So let's take those one by one. So ISO is digital gain. If your camera can't get enough light, it enhances the information that it has and brightens the image up. Now this is an imperfect process, it's adding information in and it can create artifacting and horrible grain and noise in the background. That's gonna be less pronounced if you've got a better quality camera, but irrespective of how good your camera is, there comes a point that you've dialed the ISO so high that you will introduce grain. That's gonna look awful against black skies and is gonna be particularly noticeable on time-lapse photography. The second setting is your aperture size, and that effectively is the size that you can open your lens up to, to allow more light in to hit the sensor. Rather confusingly, it's done in F numbers, where the smaller the number, the bigger the aperture size. That's got to do with the depth of field that it can focus on, and don't worry about that, guys. Ignore that entirely. That's not relevant for time-lapse photography. So the lower the F number, the bigger the aperture size, the better that's gonna be for time-lapse photography. You almost certainly want something that's an f2.8 or lower. If you can get an f1.8, then fantastic. Something like the Nifty 50 for the Canon range will really give the maximum amount of light and will allow you to keep that ISO a little bit lower. And the third is your shutter release time. So this is the amount of time that the aperture actually opens up and allows light to hit the sensor. That's gonna be really, really, really important for the nighttime photography, getting those beautiful streaks of light, and will be very important for astrophotography. Those stars, albeit to the human eye, are noticeable. The camera is gonna to struggle to pick those up, so you're gonna need a really, really long exposure. And exposure is a really, really important topic for us to talk about as well. Most modern DSLRs have an exposure indicator on them. It's a line that normally sits at the bottom of your LCD screen. If you can't see it, you might need to press your info button a couple of times. 
and that indicator when it's in the center of the line indicates that you've got a properly exposed frame. Now, one word of warning here, guys, it looks at the whole frame and it averages the light across it. So if you've got a particularly bright light in the top right hand corner and a particularly dark segment in the bottom left hand corner, it's gonna take the mean of those and say that the frame is properly exposed. So it's a slightly crude instrument. If it's to the left of the line, it's underexposed. And if it's to the right of the central line, it's overexposed. You can get cameras that use things called zebras that help you understand whether individual parts of the image are underexposed or overexposed. You can get a thing called Magic Lantern, which I will do a future video on for the Canon Ranger cameras that introduces those features. You do have to flash your BIOS in order to do that, so there's some risk associated with doing that. So, let's get on to our first time lapse. This is gonna be the everyday people walking, normally well lit environment where you're gonna want a normal exposure, you're gonna want that indicator on the middle of the line. Let's take a look at my example and then I'll show you how I did it. first time lapse is the simplest time lapse. It's daytime conditions, we set for a normal exposure and I pointed my camera out of the window. My aperture length of time for exposure was well below my intervalometer, so it was a really straightforward set of shots to catch. I captured somewhere between 700 and 800 shots and what you do, Premiere Pro has a fantastic feature where you select the first of your photographs and remember that these will be photographs and you check a box that says it's a sequence. Premiere Pro will automatically import those as a video file. It will match the frame rate of your video and you can add whatever underlying track that you want underneath it. Really simple and straightforward to do. Stepping up slightly in the complexities of the nighttime shots, it's essentially the same principle. You're going to take a series of photographs strung together, but you're going to extend the exposure time so that you get the beautiful streaks of lights from the cars. I set that typically between two and three seconds, and I set a intervalometer speed that was ever so slightly slower than that. So effectively, once I've got the balance of the exposure right, you've got the roundabout, you've got the foreground and the background that stays very static. Try to avoid windy days to do this. And then you've got the beautiful streaks as the cars wrap around. And then the most complicated of the three, you've got the astrophotography. Now, the exposure is gonna be very difficult to do on this. The lights are visible to the human eye, but they're gonna be difficult to pick up on the camera. And the balance that you need to strike is a long enough exposure time that you pick up on the stars, but not so long that you get streaks in the sky. And the rule of thumb is known as the 500 rule. So you take 500 and you divide it by the focal length of your lens. So if you have a focal length of 16 millimeters, you would divide that from 500, and that gives you the number of seconds that you should have your exposure set to. Now remember, if you've got a micro four thirds camera or you've got an APC-C crop sensor, then you need a multiplying factor for your focal length to make sure that you get the right division for APC, for APC, apologies, for APS-C crop sensors, you need to multiply your focal length by 1.6. So you take that 1.6 factor focal length, divide it from 500, and that gives you the amount of time that you need to expose your stars for. Of course, make sure that you dial your ISO down as far as it can go so that you get an appropriate exposure, remembering that you're getting a mean averaging of the total frame of the camera. So there we go, guys. Time lapses, really simple and straightforward to do. It's not just Casey Neistat that can do them. I hope you've really enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. 
If you're not already subscribed, please do so by bashing the button down there. I hope you're really well wherever in the world you are, and I'll see you in my next video.